This is a special episode of the Immunology Podcast, Immunology 2024, Day 5. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Jason Goldsmith and Dr. Brenda Roud. Welcome back to the Immunology Podcast, where we have conversations with immunologists. Today we're back with our final episode from Immunology 2024 in Chicago. We'll be discussing highlights and sharing our thoughts on how it all went. If you're tuning in for the first time, be sure to visit www.immunologypodcast.com or your favorite podcast app to check out episodes covering the first four days of the meeting. We're going to be kicking off things in just a minute. Before we get to that... Whether you're looking to attend an immunology conference this year or to expand your network, make the most out of your experience by downloading our collection of tools to help you prepare for your next meeting. Stem Cell Technologies' downloadable checklists and guides include recommendations on how to get ready before attending conferences, tips for networking, best practices for a LinkedIn profile, and more. Download the conference toolkit at stemcell.com slash conference hyphen toolkit. All right. We've gone so far to the last day. Indeed, half day here. All right. All no, right. No nostalgia, no sentimentalism. It's gone. This is the end. We're not going to see each other for a while. Any last words? I guess Jason. that's true. I won't get to see you for a bit. That right? is sad. But it's been fun. I mean, I'm taking you for hot pot after this for your first time. Indeed. So we'll do that. A nice farewell lunch. All right. Now All right. we can proceed now to we can the proceed. talks of the so morning. So discussing uh, metabolism and food and such, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about immunometabolism a little bit today. So I went to major symposia G, subcellular compartment settling the regulation of immune responses. So I'm going to highlight a couple of talks from this. Uh, the first one was by Ronald Peralata from the University of Pittsburgh, titled Dysfunction of Exhausted T-Cells is Enforced by MCT11-Mediated Lactate Metabolism. So MCT11 is a lactate transporter. It's part of the monocarboxylate transporters. And his question was really, what is sustaining exhausted T-cell metabolisms in the tuner microenvironment? We know that, you know, it's this chronic state, chronic antigen exposure, but metabolism components as well. What's going on here? And so they had some data that shows that Tregs transport lactate, and that was tied to MTC11. MCT11 is a type 1 bidirectional proton coupled transporter. That's the background. So he takes the point, he like looking at what T cells uptake, and he found that they took up an oxidized lactic acid. And these exhausted T cells have better capacity to take up lactic acid than regular T-cells. And he figured out it was MCT11 mediated based on the knockout mouse and that these exhausted T-cells upregulate MCT11. And then from some signaling studies showed they maintain exhaustion. So that was interesting. And then he showed that if you take an antibody to MCT to inhibit it and block it from uptaking lactate, you actually improve mouse tumor models. So by keeping them away from the lactate, you get them out of this exhaustion loop. So that was the first study. But I got one talk I'm really excited about that I got to get into, which is Jonathan Brestoff from Washington University at St. Louis. It's mitochondrial transfer to macrophages in metabolic diseases, but it's also about neutrophils, which is unpublished stuff that I get to talk about a little bit. So we know white adipose tissues contain diverse immune cells population that regulate metabolic homeostasis. They're type two skewed and macrophages are really important there. Something else he said we kind of know happens, but it's relatively new, is mitochondria transfer between cells in the body. Like they leave one place and go to another. And apparently there's more cell-free mitochondria in the blood than there are immune cells. Wow. That, that's a lot, right? Like, like, huh. So there's mitochondria floating around in our, in our blood here, more than immune cells. Whoa. So then he shows that mitochondria transfer to macrophages from host cells and adipose tissue. He has this mito mouse tracker system that he made a fluorescent thingamajigger for. But the adipose, and he did a CRISPR knockout screen to figure out what allows capture. But basically, adipocytes are sending mitochondria to macrophages. And it's through what? heparin sulfate pathways and specifically ext1 deletion inhibited this due to less heparin sulfate in the future on the surface but there's other pathways too but mice get fatter with a high fat diet if you knock this out so that you don't have mitochondria update mice get fatter with a high fat diet and have more white tissue so you get fatter if you can't have your adipose tissue send mitochondria to your macrophages think about that hmm. And they also found that dietary long-chain fatty acids promote release of adipocyte-driven mitochondria in the circulation for distribution to distant organs, and that protects against ischemia of reperfusion injury. But wait, there's a whole other type of fat, right? That's brown fat. Brown fat is to create thermogenesis, right? It's what's really important to protect us from getting cold. And I guess he has a lot of mitochondria. Yes, but they send their mitochondria to neutrophils. What? And it's even more crazy. Oh, come on, this is crazy. And the mitochondria rapidly migrate to brown fat upon a cold challenge. No, no, you're not. If you deplete the neutrophils, 
of a mouse, they have impaired defense to core body temps. So if you like take a mouse and put it in like a cold shock situation, you yeah. usually live. If you deplete their neutrophils or get rid of them in their entirety, yeah. the mice die. No, no, if you transfer, no, no, If you transfer on. neutrophils from a neutrophil-less mouse in and then do the cold challenge, they're just fine. Uh, because they are shuttling mitochondria around? They don't know yet, but they do know that neutrophils have more oxidative phosphorylation upon entering brown fat and that the brown fat send mitochondria to the neutrophils during cold challenge. I mean, this is like that story where they're transferring like telomeres from one cell to the other. It's Well, this one they can just watch. They can just see the mitochondria migrate. But the, the, the killer thing is if you get rid of neutrophils in a mouse and you put it in a cold bath, it dies. It can't handle the cold challenge where a regular mouse is just fine or if you replete the neutrophils it's fine and they can literally watch the mitochondria transferring and how is it like there's like a like a union is like the membrane or it just it sucks it up yeah and sucks it up because yeah. there is an the extracellular outside of the cell and they just pick them up yeah they go to different organs and yep, yep. that's so bizarre isn't that cool yeah <laughs> is this published the the macrophage is the neutrophil is not okay because they want to get more mechanism all right wild right so your neutrophils are important for the warmth of your body i i am i'm still i'm still in shock yeah uh, ah all right what else well there are a couple other ones one that i can go on real quick is mm -hmm. nadeep chandel at northwestern also mm -hmm. looking at mitochondria as a signaling organelle to control immunity yeah he's looking at the different parts of the mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation chain and he showed that complex three is necessary for lps induction of protein levels And then he went really fast and I couldn't gather all of what was going on, but basically it's not required for respiration, but the LPS induction is still based on that complex. Mm. So it just has to do, I think, with uh, coupling reactions is doing it. And then the QPC subunit, if you lose that myeloid cell and myeloid cells, you have worse outcomes with influenza A. So the mitochondrial complex, various parts of it are actually involved in signaling of other pathways. And that's cool. All right. So it's, they, they aren't just ATP pumps. All right. And that's what I got here. I'm still back on neutrophils for body warmth. Yeah, after that, you were just too shocked to think of anything else. All right. So I did a little bit of session hopping. I started with one of the smaller symposia with short talks. And I just want to highlight some of the talks. First up was Patrick Ho from University of California, San Francisco from the KC Tang Lab. And they were looking into the fragility of the T-Rex phenotype when you put the T-Rex uh, with inflammatory cytokines. I think it's rather well established on, on, on murine T-Rex. And he, so he looked into human T-Rex. So if you culture the T-Rex in uh, inflammatory cytokines, then you, you lose uh, the, the T-Rex phenotype to some extent. And so he kind of measured this uh, dysfunctional T-Rex phenotype. So he did a lot of characterization of these cells, uh, looked into uh, transcriptome, chromatin accessibility, uh, transcription factor to motive enrichment. I think it was really good as a, as a, as a resource to understand these cells. Sometimes I'm a little bit skeptical sometimes about the existence of these cells. One of the conclusions of his work was that there was this pivotal role for IRF4 dysregulation. This X T Rex or this fragile T Rex have gained chromatin accessibility and this IRF4 distal element that is one of the drivers of this loss of phenotype. It's very interesting to to look into how this, this T Rex originate and, and establish because I think there's still a little bit of doubt of whether they are really losing their phenotypes, a, a T-Reg as original T-Reg, then it's not a T-Reg. Oftentimes, uh, I think that if you're working on culture cells, then you can have just an overgrowth of contaminating uh, conventional cells. Sometimes I wasn't completely convinced, but definitely a point to keep investigating. And I thought it was also very interesting, the talk from Lindsay Palo from the University of British Columbia. She did a really good job talking about tolerogenic mRNA vaccines. Well, it looks like a collaboration with a company. So I was a little bit disappointed because she couldn't give any information about what this vaccine had, which epitopes it had in the mRNA, what was the immunomodulatory uh, reagents that it used. But basically, they have this multi-cargo lipid nanoparticle with uh, mRNA against several pancreatic antigens together with immunomodulators. So the idea is you want to generate a protective response. And they could see that indeed they could protect mice from type 1 diabetes using this using immunization with these LMPs. Part of these was mediated, but maybe a regulatory T cell induction. I think she's there still working on the mechanism and they could, she couldn't tell anything about what was exactly on LPNs. But I thought it was very interesting because this is not the first time I hear about LPNs and mRNA vaccination for immunomodulation. 
And I think it's a very intriguing angle to the whole mRNA vaccination field. So very interested. From the following session, so after the session, I moved to one of the major symposia because it was, the session start, uh, finished earlier. And I got there right as uh, Mark uh, Slomchik from University of Pittsburgh. He was also a, a guest in our show. He was talking about extra follicular responses, uh, visa response, and that this was basically the, th the theme of the whole symposia, or at least as much as, as I saw. And I think it's very interesting, and I learned a lot. I don't know a lot about B cells in general, and definitely not a lot about extra follicular responses in B cells. I'm always thinking, you know, in my mind, it's always the B cells go to the follicle, they make a germinal center, they get, you know, activated by T cells, they affinity migrate, they change, you know, isotypes, and they become super nice memory or plasma cells and things like that. But there is a whole alternative pathway in which the B cells don't go to a germinal center and they still generate memory cells that are making antibodies, but they never were kind of instructed by a T cell. The different diseases have a tendency to have a more extra follicular or germinal center based B cell response. So he talked a little bit about that. And one example is a response to salmonella infection that actually lacks germinal centers for the first few weeks, but you still have antibody responses. So the lack of GCs for your centers is replaced by a huge expansion of extra follicular plasma blasts and B cell blasts, which are antigen specific, but have low affinity, which is unsurprising because they're not able to undergo affinity imagination without a proper germinal center. The idea that he started, and I think all other talks kind of built on, is not only are extra follicular responses happening, but they actually can inhibit proper germinal center responses. If you have a, a skewage towards this extra follicular, and this seems to be actually preventing high affinity germinal center reactions to, from happening. And one of the mechanisms that Mark showed in his presentation was that IL-12 had a lot to do with this. An original source of IL-12 of unclear origin stimulates activated B cells and activate B cells from a naive B cell state. This induces B cells to generate interferon gamma and also IL-12, so there's a positive feedback loop. These cytokines can also prevent proper T follicular helper differentiation, which is needed for germinal center generation, and actually skew the T cells towards a Th1 phenotype. So you end up having Th1 cells, a lot of interferon gamma, and you have extra follicular uh, plasma cells that are actually not non-derived from our germinal center. Th this idea was kind of continued. So after that, we had Frances Lund from the University of Alabama at Birmingham, also former guest in the podcast. She's talking about talking about extra follicular differentiated B cells, and she talks about these T bet high cells that have an extra follicular what is as associated as an extra follicular signature. Uh, and this, I think, if I understand correctly, CD11C positive, CXCR5 negative. So that's why they don't go to the, they're not associated to the germinal center. But they have a lot of TBED. And these cells can be found like early after, for example, influenza vaccination. And they express CD27, which kind of associates with a memory phenotype. So are these like memory extra follicular B cells? In this particular population, they actually showed high affinity receptors. They seem to be isotype switched, which then makes you think, are they germinal centers? Where are these cells coming from? The conclusion of her talk was that sometimes it's hard to like use markers to... Uh, there's a bit of a confusion or, or a ambiguity on the markers that people are using to differentiate extra follicular from germinal center derived B cells. So she thinks that this particular population of Tibet high cells are actually not necessarily of extra follicular origin, but they acquire an extra follicular effector signature, which is different from proper memory B cells and different from like naive B cells, and that they are poised for generating antibodies more so than a memory B cell. This is interesting because it is not so clear. I think CXCR5 negative and CCR7 negativity is a little bit easier to associate with a non-follicular uh, migration because those are needed for, for B cell follicles. But then there's other markers that are a bit more difficult to associate and there seems to be some confusion or ambiguity in them. So this extra follicular signature, CXCR5 negative, FCRL5 positive, but they're Tibet high, they're actually, they're switch memory, so they're not necessarily extra follicular. Continuing on that, on that note, there was uh, Young Soo Lee from the Korean 
Institute of Science and Technology. And he also was talking about this Tibet high atypical memory B cells. After mRNA vaccination, in this case for COVID, talking about atypical V memory cells with this extra follicular uh, factor signature and how they find them after several rounds of mRNA vaccination, you can find these cells. They're also found in various chronic diseases. He did some RNA sequence and some characterizations. Again, he kind of zeroes down of these C11C positive, FCRL5 positive cells, and that they are more poised to produce IgG compared to traditional memory B cells. And they seem to be just as protective and as capable of neutralizing the acid that he did as conventional kind of canonical memory B cells. So, So yeah, it's a little bit tough because on the one hand you have this extra follicular responses that happen they clearly happen in certain diseases and so and this is all the talk by Ignacio Sanz afterwards from Emory I think again he kind of zeroed down on this idea that you have in certain circumstances you're going to have memory B cell responses that are not depending on the germinal centers and these are often associated with autoimmunity or with aberrant responses and in part and this is what uh, Ignacio Sanz talk was a lot about because they are not subject to their regular tolerance mechanisms that B cells experience during germinal centers because they are interacting with CD4 cells. So there's other checkpoints that they have to go through. In this case, extra follicular B cells can activate without these checkpoints. And that's why oftentimes they're associated with SLE. And in this case, also autoimmunity after severe COVID, he make a really good point about the function of these extra follicular B uh, responses in Ultimately, after severe COVID. So, very interesting. I, I thought it was, uh, yeah, it was very good. So, I'm waiting for innate B cells. Innate B cells. Yeah. Innate B cells. What would that mean? Well, we think about it. We have innate T cells now, right? ILCs, mm. lymphocytes. So that we're just, it's all smear. Calling it now just for so <laughs> exactly for the future. You heard it here first, it was, it was Jason's idea. All right, so this uh, brings us to the end of our conference. This is the end of our Immunology 24 episode series. It's been fun. We've met a lot of people. We had people coming on to talk to us, and we had all these talks, and we got a lot of nice ideas for our research and our life. Uh, And we can't wait until we meet again in next year in Honolulu in Hawaii. I'm so excited. I hope you guys can also join uh, next year and that you enjoy the the series so far. Uh, It's been fun to make. Don't forget that you can subscribe to our newsletter at immunologypodcast.com and you can also reach out to us on X at immunopodcast or via email at info at immunologypodcast.com if you have any feedback. See you next time.